that's all live. If anybody has any issues seeing our screen or the software, or sorry, the webcam and the um, software, let me know and we can uh, try to troubleshoot that. But if not, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through what you're seeing. And that is the Artec Space Spider, and it is a structure light scanner. So the way it is working is it's projecting a grid onto this object, in this case a very mechanical object that uh, will come into play later with a reverse engineering process. And it's measuring how that grid distorts around it um, in addition to tracking with the changes in geometry. It's also tracking the changes in texture. And Artec refers to texture as color data. So for example, the turntable, all the writing on it is actually helping to keep the relative positioning, which is fairly unique to the Artec line of products, which is also a reason why we don't need to have any tracking dots in the environment. Probably should make mention as well, if you have any questions, please uh, type those questions into the chat box and uh, David will read those questions out so we can get everything answered for you as well. <coughs> Got it. Another point uh, worth making mention of is the process that you're seeing right now for scanning, as well as the process for reverse engineering that we'll go through when we take it over to Carter, is for all intents and purposes exactly the same. Uh, whether you're using the Space Spider, the Eva, the Leo, the Ray, or the Micro for that matter, uh, it will all basically be the same. So while Nick was talking, I went ahead and I spun this part 180 degrees in physical space. We're going to go ahead and capture the underside of this gear here. And then what we'll do is we'll take a third scan, which is probably redundant data at this point. However, what that'll do is it'll help me stitch them um, together. And I'll do it on its side. That way it allows me to get front-back continuity and kind of use that as a backbone to stitch the rest of the scan data into. So Realistically, these two scans have enough data. The third scan is just to help the human operator piece it all back together. So a little bit about the Space Fighter here in general. It is a structured blue light, where some of the other scanners are structured white light. This scanner has a resolution and accuracy of about 50 microns, which is about 2,000. The objects are generally for this scanner designed to be something the size of a baby's tooth, not up to something the size of a beach ball. However, uh, it's usually not the scanner necessarily that limits the size of object that you can scan with it. Sometimes it comes down to the uh, specs of the computer and amount of time that you've got because the data sets can be pretty large. The field of view of this particular scanner is about the size of a postcard. And as compared to the EVA that has a field of view of about the size of a regular sheet of paper. And then the LEO is very much adjustable. The Space Spider has a, uh, it, it will collect frames at about eight frames per second. The EVA is about 16 frames per second. And the LEO will, is adjustable as well, but can be up to 80 frames per second. Um, you can also use all three scanners, or all five scanners, I guess, for that matter, in the same scan environment. So if you have something that is larger that you want to scan with, say, the EVA or the LEO, and you had some areas on it where you wanted to have higher detail and higher resolution, you could simply scan those sections with the Space Spider and stitch those together. That way you've got the higher resolution on the areas where you need that extra detail. So Nick, what do we got going on here? Right, so what we're looking at is the three scan groupings I've done. Each time I manipulated the object in physical space. So you can see right now they're kind of haphazardly aligned and not very useful data at this point. So what we're going to do is first isolate out the noise, in this case the turntable on which I scanned, and also for the class set, the little bit of play I used to hold this in position. So we'll go through and we'll use a face removal tool, um, which I guess should be worth mentioning that everything from this point in 
Um, so after you collect the data and it's um, input into the system, everything that I'm about to show you has an autopilot equivalent. So we just like to um, show it in a manual hands-on fashion as it um, is a little more conducive to a demo environment. I'm going to go ahead and take a paint sampling of our turntable here. And what that's going to do is have the system put a best fit plane through. That's going to be pretty good. I'm going to adjust it upwards a little bit and erase it so that it's no longer contacting the scan body. And I'm going to go through and use our lasso tool to get the remainder here. So. Um, this turntable is great. It's nice and branded for our tech studio. However, it does move and contour a little bit. So this edge that you're seeing on screen here was just uh, floating up a little bit. So that's why the um, cutoff plane selection didn't get it in its entirety. So we'll go ahead and switch back to our cutoff plane. Now we're on to our second data set. So on to our third, I'm actually just going to go ahead and nudge the plane up so that it eliminates all the modeling play. Because with this data, I'm actually just looking to connect the first two front to back. And I don't really need the bottom data there. So better to isolate out the modeling play. So there's our clean data. And we're going to go into the align stage. And by default, it populates the top scan and the stat to be your keystone scan, the one that you piece everything else to. And that can be good. Um, in this particular instance, I'm going to go ahead and manually tell it that I want the last scan in the stack to be the one that we align everything to. And you'll notice I've added a little bit of a sharpie on one of the teeth of the gears here. That's just mainly to inform me as to where these line up, um, as it would be very hard to tell one tooth from another. I have gotten it to automatically align um, with just the computer's feature recognition. However, uh, I want it to be a little safer here in a demo environment and, and adding a little bit of um, an assistance here with that line. So I'm just scrolling and um, dragging kind of haphazard points. It doesn't have to be super scientific. It's just kind of speeding along the feature recognition algorithm. You can see that um, held position pretty nicely there. And just like that, we have a composite image of our three scan groupings. So now that those are aligned, we're going to jump into our tools column here. And I guess that's something to uh, mention is our tech studio, while being incredibly powerful software, is also really, really user friendly in so much as everything's kind of laid out in a uh, top down order as to when you need to use certain operations. It's very, very user friendly in addition to the full um, automated autopilot. Um, so it gives you access to really fine nitty gritty settings um, and also gives you the ability to restore them to manufacturer's default um, without having to memorize a ton of options. So you can see here this box is filled in. If you go ahead and unclick that, it just restores it to what the manufacturer recommends. So you don't need to memorize settings and you can always get back to a default if need be. So I'm running a global registration right now, which is going to start taking a average of how well the individual frames align. Now you'll remember Nick mentioned that the spider scans at eight frames per second. So right now in my first data set, I have about 450. In my second one, call it 465 and 311. So quite a sizable amount of frames. And what this global registration does is it assigns a max error value which is a unitless uh, metric that Artec uses to designate how well scans are aligning to each other. So the higher the max error, the less quality of alignment that they have. So I'm going to go ahead and isolate out the point threes and the point twos in this group. In this case, there were, call it, less than 10 total frames from the group. And by eliminating those, that lets us run the end result at a higher resolution. So I'm just doing that for the rest of our groupings here. And that will allow me to run my fusion at a much sharper resolution. I'm sure later we'll discuss what a fusion is as well. 
Right, yeah. So I've started the processing and I chose a sharp fusion, but you might see that there are also a fast and a smooth fusion option. And fast fusion is going to be computationally the quickest and it's going to be the most accurate data. It's great for taking measurements and comparing back to original CAD. However, you lack any ability to patch and repair holes. Whereas the smooth fusion is actually going to be the longest processing time. It goes through and it normalizes surfaces. So it's great for 3D printing and art applications, but maybe not the most applicable for reverse engineering use cases. So I chose the sharp fusion, and that's due to the fact that it's a nice blend of the fast and the smooth, in so much as it doesn't attempt to distort the surface. However, it has the ability to patch and repair holes. So you see we have a result here, and we have some floating kind of noise that got tessellated. So I'm just going to select a small object filter, and just like that, our data has been cleaned up. And this is to the point we can export this to any of your standard um, tessellated model formats, so kind of your FTLs, your OBJs, some carry texture or color data, uh, others do not. Um, right now, the color data has not been mapped to this part, and that would be another step. However, being that this is a mechanical part, and for reverse engineering use cases, I don't think adding the texture data will do any good. So it's kind of at this point that I would jump this data over to my coworker, Carter, and he'll start explaining kind of the reverse engineering process and how you can turn this mesh format into something that's usable and parametric in nature. Let me go ahead and get Carter set up with our screen share here. <clears throat> so while we're doing that, the software packages that we're going to highlight today are going to be a combination of Geomagic for SolidWorks and DesignX. Uh, those two are the best reverse engineering tools on the market today. And um, Geomagic for SolidWorks is kind of as the name indicates for SolidWorks exclusively, where DesignX is the fastest path from scan to CAD, and it works also with SOLIDWORKS, as well as Siemens NX, Solid Edge, Inventor, Creo, Pro Engineer, basically just about everything that um, you're going to do any mechanical modeling into. So with that, maybe Carter, do you want to go ahead and start, uh, introduce yourself and uh, start doing, showing them the reverse engineering process? Sure, so I'll be taking you through um, this is a basic reverse engineering process in DesignX. We use DesignX because, uh, like Nick mentioned, there's a couple different softwares, but DesignX is really the fastest way to take the scan data to fully reverse engineer um, solid, their metric solid. Uh, you can also use Geomagic for SolidWorks. It just has less tools. And it's just going to take you a little bit longer. But uh, with that, we'll just jump right in. So here, if you look on my screen, you can see We've got the scan data here uh, that Nick just took of this gear. We've got two different gear sides here. As you can see, uh, it, you know, when, when we import this scan, it's kind of just floating in 3D space. It's not aligned to our global origin. It's just kind of out there. So first things first, we're going to have the um, software kind of uh, look at this part and try and determine, you know, uh, the different uh, geometries of this part. So basically, we did an auto segment, and it's telling us, you know, oh, it recognizes this purple section here as a plane. It recognizes that this is a cylinder here in the middle. It even recognizes, you know, we've got some rounds here on some of the edges. So basically, what we're going to do to align it, I'm going to add a vector cylinder to get the axial through the center of this part. Then we'll go into the alignment. Hope that we're aligning the gear. Move this over. And basically we're just saying I want you to align it to this vector and this plane. And then we'll make the Z axis this vector. Then this part is not as important, but I'm just gonna clock the part so that this X axis runs through this uh, tooth on the gear. Now, if I show you our reference planes, you can see that they are lined up so that the part is centered up at the uh, global origin. So from here, we can start creating um, our solid bodies. So basically, just like you would in SOLIDWORKS or really any um, general uh, 
CAD software or selecting the plane we want to perform a sketch on, then this software allows me to pull profiles from this uh, scan data. So I'm just going to do the basic, hide my mesh here. We're just going to do this um, initial plate that runs through the center of the part. So I'm just going to kind of get it close, about where I want it to be. Use the Smart Dimension tool, again, just like you would in SolidWorks. And then I'll add this, uh, I'll add this uh, center hole in a second. Okay. Uh, all right, yeah, I'll add that at the end. So we'll exit our sketch. Show our scan data again. And we will extrude that sketch. So here I'm just manually dragging it. You'll notice as we come up here, it'll snap onto, it snaps just to the first face that it senses. And this is kind of where um, the human element comes in. Basically, we see that it says, it's estimating that this is uh, 1.4999 millimeters. We can just go ahead and assume that that's was designed to be one and a half millimeters. So we'll accept, and then we've got the start of our solid body here. Another thing I wanted to show quick, um, the fact that, so I talked about how it's sensing, you know, cylinders or planes on this object. That's also really helpful um, for, you know, the scanners are a lot at, more accurate than what we can actually even see with our eyes. So, so when I was originally looking at this part, I didn't even notice that the top of it is actually not flat. And the software recognizes this as kind of a cone shape. So um, that'll come in later when we cut the top of this gear off. So we're going to do a sketch for this gear on this top plane. We'll do another mesh sketch. Just pull a profile of the gear. Hide our mesh. Go through and draw it just like we would draw it if we were making this uh, part from scratch. I guess that's probably a noteworthy piece right there, Carter, is that the intent of the software in going through this process is to do a full reverse engineer so that when we're done, it'll have an entire feature tree with planes and cylinders, and it would be as if it was built in SolidWorks or said uh, CAD program, correct? Exactly, yeah. So Basically, if you're, I mean, if you're a SolidWorks user, this will look super familiar to you, and that's how they, that's how they want it to be. It's just, it's going to be really um, friendly and familiar uh, to people who are used to using CAD, and that's how it then builds the actual feature tree in SolidWorks. So basically, here I'm just, I just chose a, the tooth that looked the best to me. Um, I'm not worrying about like making these teeth super symmetrical accurate just because this is a, a demo and we don't need to make it uh, precise just for time's sake and then basically we have all the same kind of tools up here that you would in any any sort of CAD package so we're going to do a circular sketch pattern about the origin we'll select the entities that we want to, to make the pattern with looks like we've got one more tooth those all line up really well. We'll accept it. Trim out some surfaces, some extra lines here so that we can extrude this all as a single piece. We'll exit the sketch. And then we'll make sure the merge is checked. So I'll bring back our scan data so we can kind of see. Like I mentioned earlier, we noticed that this was a cone, so I'm going to just actually extrude this higher because we know I'll go back in and, and cut that curved surface out. Okay. So next, we're going to find that curve. Again, this is just something that, you know, there's really no other way for you to measure this or just even just, I mean, really you know, even eyeballing it or something like that. There's no way to really accurately capture the shape of these teeth or, um, or yeah, even just that slight curve on the top of this gear face. So here, basically, I'm doing the same kind of uh, 
just kind of pulling the curvature on the top, but I'm taking an average of all of the teeth, which is another super, super nice feature of this software. So we'll hide our scan data again, go back to this, and I'll just add this vector to our sketch, fit an arc to the sketch, along that top curve. Extend that out. Bring this out here. And we're just creating a general shape for cutting the top of this off. Close that. We will revolve and cut that piece. So now we have that same kind of general curvature along the top of the Same kind of uh, same kind of workflow for the other side. This gear is just a little bit different. I'll show that to you here really quick. This is actually a, a project that we're working on for a customer. This is a gear inside of a window of a I think it's a '67 Thunderbird. I think Thunderbird. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and uh, they are no longer making this component for. I think it's for a power window or window, so I'm sorry, I don't know if it's powered or not. But uh, the, we need to use this gear to make to another gear so that he can take the new component and mount it to or made it to the old component to make this work. And so this is actually a real life project that, that you're seeing here as well. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> So we did have some questions that were emailed in. Um, I'd like to ask some of those to you, Carter, and so Perfect, uh, yeah. while you're working on that. Um, the first one is uh, pretty simple. Uh, is Design X brand specific, or does it work with other scanners? I can go ahead and take that, Carter, while you're clicking around. Okay. Cool. Uh, one of the beauties about uh, the Geomagic Suites is that they are not brand specific. So if you already have some sort of touch probe or a CMM or LiDAR or other technology, um, you can use any of the reverse engineering tools through Geomagic or any with any of the hardware as well. Yep, exactly. So this is going to be the exact same exact same process whether we're working with yeah our tech data or something from Preform or really anything. And um, Yeah, and then what you're seeing here again, I'm just kind of picking a tooth that I think looks the best on this on this uh, shape. Trim away the excess. We're not worried about symmetry here, just for time's sake on the demo. And we're gonna wrap this tooth around. This one's got one less tooth on this side. Fits nicely. Trim out these pieces. And then we can exit our sketch and extrude. And again, the software, I'll just kind of drag it close. The software should recognize, again, it thinks it's about 5.52. We can just assume the human operator that is probably designed to be five and a half millimeters. One of the other beauties too here is that if you are taking a physical object and you need to make modifications to it, Carter, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, or maybe you will hear in a little bit anyways, um, whether you want to make changes now or uh, down the process of the reverse engineering process here? Yeah, so, you know, What's great about this, so this, basically it's like, you know, these are the same kind of tools as, as if you were going to be making this in SOLIDWORKS, like we had said earlier, but um, basically you can make changes in here and be using all these extra helpful tools to kind of, um, you know, pull 
the profiles of, of, of different cross sections of your scan data, but it's just as easy and just as valid to make changes uh, once we transfer it over to SOLIDWORKS or whatever program you'd be using. This time instead of merging, we're going to cut that center hole out. We are just about done with this part. We go and overlay both on top of each other. We can check and see how close we are in certain areas. So it looks like you know we're missing our round right here and right there, right there. So we can come back to our part. Another beautiful feature of the software, which is just would be impossible really any other way other than scanning and then taking it in here. So we can select these edges. We can tell the software to estimate. What, is, what does it think those are? And so it's saying it's about 0.7558. Say it's probably about a 0.7 round on those edges. Um, and I'll add the edges in here. But you can also just visually overlay them on the sketch and play around with it manually. So it looks about how it should on that curve. I'll add in one more set of fillets just to make the part look extra nice and then um, we'll transfer it over to SOLIDWORKS. So yeah, just those curvatures in there. We'll check those out. Let's fit those curves pretty well. Okay, so there in about 20 minutes we've taken part from the scan that Nick provided us and we've recreated two gears um, that ordinarily would be you know next to impossible if you didn't have scan data or this reverse engineering software. So now we have our part. It's as simple as one button press and it'll send it over to SOLIDWORKS. So press OK, open up our SOLIDWORKS. Basically, you can see it's just doing all the same sketches that I was doing in the software and um, building it just how I built it in DesignX. Do you have any other questions there, David? Uh, yeah, we sure do. Um, what is the most difficult part of the scan and SolidWorks process? Yeah, I think the most difficult part, pro probably the most difficult part would be um, just trying to, hmm, probably just trying to um, guess or try and get into the mind of whoever designed the original part. Mm -hmm. So you can be like, hmm, I think that they probably meant for this to be a certain way. But basically, you just have to kind of go about it like, okay, if I was building this part from scratch, where would I start? And there's no one right way to do it. It all depends on your own workflow. Um, probably what the end mm -hmm. goal is for, right? And sure, exactly. Yeah. So that's all the different pieces there. Yeah. I have one more for you for now. Um, can I reverse engineer an STL file from Thingiverse? Yeah. So kind of like we talked about with, at the beginning, um, just like this software can take scan data from any kind of scanner, you can take I mean, all of that's just point cloud data, and that's the same thing you'd be downloading off of Thingiverse. So it can take that data, and, and um, you can still reverse engineer from it. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what SolidWorks is doing here is just creating all of these relations in the uh, part that we had uh, added. So when I was trimming out all those edges, it was saying all of this outer circle, these inner circles are all concentric. So SolidWorks is just making sure that that works out. And it's doing that automatically? Yep. All of this, I'm not doing anything right now. Wow. So yeah, there it just added all of the final, well, here it's adding the final rounds on the part. As you can see over here, we've got a full feature tree. It's got all the extrusions, the revolve on that cut that I made on the top, and then all of these uh, fillets that we added right at the end. So fully feature-based part, you can go back in here say, hey, actually, let's edit this sketch. We want this gear to be, oh wait, that's editing the sketch. Um, we want it to 
edit the extrusion. So we'll exit this sketch. If you wanted to make this gear taller or something, you can edit this feature. Just as if we'd made it in SOLIDWORKS. Instead of five and a half millimeters, let's make it seven millimeters. A little bit taller. Accept it. And there we go. As simple as that. So basically, it's as if I had created this part in SOLIDWORKS. We also have, from time to time, where we're dealing with organics and uh, mechanical shapes at the same time, right, Kurt? Yeah, that is for sure. So, yeah, sometimes, yeah, sometimes we'll get parts like, you know, if we just had something like someone's hand with this watch on it. We could easily reverse engineer the watch. It's like, okay, this is a cylinder and, you know, all these different components fit together, but a hand is not can't parametrically model a hand. Um, it's more of an organic shape. So something like that, it's actually a simpler process to turn it into an STL, or excuse me, an STP file, um, import into SOLIDWORKS or other CAD software. So we basically just take our scan data again, and uh, we're going to do, where is it? oh, here it is. Basically, we do what's called an auto surface. So, the software looks at the part and basically it wraps, kind of like shrink wraps a quilted surface around it. So, unlike um, in our export where it's like this is one face, this is a face, this is, you know, an extruded cylinder, uh, you'll see the faces don't follow the actual geometry of the part. Um, but something, again, like if, if we did a scan of my hand, there aren't any specific faces or um, geometries that it could fit. So we just press OK. And it'll do that. And then you can also combine data. So if we had, you know, yeah, a gear, a gear is part of it, and then some crazy shape that's not made up of uh, regular geometry, you can combine both those together to import it to SOLIDWORKS. So for a comparison sake, Carter, Nick's double checking right now of how many polygons were in the scan data, which sure. wouldn't import very nicely into SOLIDWORKS or give you the ability to work at all sure. um, or make any changes to it like you just shown. Yeah. Um, that's where this auto service comes in. How, Nick, did you notice how many polygons it was? Right, yeah. So this um, scan data has 160,000 individual polygons in it. Yeah, exactly, right? You couldn't do much with that. This is going to be, I'm not sure how to exactly check, but, you know, this is probably less than 100 faces on here. And, it, you know, the software does its best to kind of fit these flat faces along the edge of this um, tooth edge. But as you can see, this is all split up into these different faces. So this is a face, this is a face. It allows you to still import to SOLIDWORKS. You can still cut out of it, but you can't really select this as a cylinder or something like that or measure as well from it. A lot of times people ask us to reverse engineer a part solely for the purposes of sending it to a uh, machinist or something like that to be CNC or something like that. Mm -hmm. Many times this is more than good enough to Tend to a, I mean, we, this is basically just a dumb step or a dumb solid here, right? Yeah, exactly. And so it's like it's so much quicker if you if you know this is the part you need, you don't need to make adjustments to it, um, and your accuracy can be slightly uh, slightly uh, less accurate than uh, an actual like parametric solid like we just built. This is an excellent excellent way to go because it's super quick and, and easy. Maybe were there any other questions that uh, came in? Um, yes. Can the software detect draft angles? Yeah. So we didn't we didn't have any draft angles on this part because this is a this is like a metal gear. And I'm sure it was machined and not uh, cast. But software can go in and detect draft angles. And again, just like I showed you on the top of this, how I I didn't realize there was actually a curve on the top of this gear. Um, it can also detect a draft angle, and it'll also give you an estimate. It'll be like 1.45 degrees, and again, you can be like, that's probably a 1.1.5 degree draft. So super helpful for reverse engineering cast parts um, or 
injection molded parts, stuff like that. And, and you may have touched on this already, but we had uh, what is a dumb solid, and could you clarify exactly what you mean by that? Yeah. So basically, so if we would export this this gear and bring it into SolidWorks. Um, We export to SolidWorks. Well, I guess I don't need to show it. Basically, what I'm saying is like, just like I showed you it, making the top this gear taller, like I did, really easy. That's not really an option with a dumb solid. You can manipulate it. You can cut, you know, you can cut holes and things into it like you would in a regular SDP. But it uh, manipulating it is is not really. Uh, yeah, you can't really change things from like a sketch perspective like you can with the parametric solid. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well, we did record this webinar, so if you have any further questions or you'd like to share with anybody, let me know and we can send a recording of this webinar out. And uh, I guess it's probably noteworthy to mention we do both scan services where you can send parts for us to do the scanning for you, as well as sell scanners and services, or scanners and software to you as well. So with that, please let us know if there's anything we can help with. And uh, we very much appreciate everybody who joined us today. Thanks so much. Have a great day.